Welcome to chapter 15. In this chapter, we will discuss the various accounting issues for different types of shares and equity instruments that public companies use to raise money in capital markets. And we'll also talk about the different components of shareholders equity. Our first learning objective in this chapter is to discuss the characteristics of the corporate form of organization, rights of shareholders and different types of shares. There are, three formi there are three primary forms of business organization. There is a proprietorship, a partnership, and a corporation. The most common form for mid to large size companies is the corporate form or corporation. The advantages of a corporation are that there's no recourse against the individual shareholders personal assets. So the most that they can lose is whatever they've invested in the company. There's no recourse in the case of bankruptcy or a lawsuit, the shareholders are protected. And this is not the case in a sole proprietorship or a partnership where you can be personally liable. Um, corporations also involve the issue of shares, which can be easily transferred. So they're a liquid form of investment for investors, and they can also lead to an easier means of raising capital. In Canada, the Small Business Corporations Act regulates corporations, and so you will see reference to the CBCA throughout this chapter. Corporations are classified by the nature of their ownership. So just because we're talking about corporations doesn't mean that all corporations are the same. So there are corporations for cities or municipalities, and they may not have shares issued. You can have government business enterprises like Canada Post or the Liquor Control Board, which may have a share or shares issued. Um, and those are all privately controlled. You can have private sector corporations. So you can have uh, not-for-profits, different churches, charities. They will not have shares issued. And for-profit, normally you would have shares issued uh, for a corporation, but the shares vary in terms of the liquidity. So a private company can still have shares issued, and those are governed by a shareholder agreement and they're not easily transferable or liquidated. Usually the shareholder agreement will specify the terms of those shares and who can hold them and how they can be liquidated, if they can be liquidated. Um, and then public companies will often have their shares listed on public stock exchanges. For instance, the New York Stock Exchange is an example. Um, and in this way, the shares can be easily traded. In order to create a corporation, the um, entity needs to submit the articles of incorporation to the provincial or federal government, depending on where the company wants to do business. If they wanna do business just in one province or if they wanna do business across Canada. Once the requirements are properly fulfilled, then the corporate charter is issued and the corporation is recognized as a legal entity according to the CBCA. In order to uh, fulfill these requirements, the articles of incorporations need to specify such things as the company name, the place of registered office, the classes, and the maximum number of shares that can be issued, any restrictions on share transfers, the number of directors, restrictions on the corporation's business, et cetera. So only once all these, uh, these these pieces of information have been submitted, then the corporate charter will be issued. And at that point, the corporation will prepare share certificates and begin issuing those to shareholders. Usually share capital consists of a large number of units. And companies can, um, can issue multiple classes of shares, as long as within each class of shares, every share is exactly the same as another share. So if you have a class B share or a class A share, every unit holder of a class A or class B share has to be entitled to the same rights and privileges. The number of shares that an individual holds will determine their interest, their percentage, their percentage interest in the business. If there's no restrictions, then each share will give basic or inherent rights to share in profits and losses, vote, so vote as part of the board of directors for management and different key decisions in the business, and uh, to share in the corporate assets upon liquidation or bankruptcy. 
there is a fourth right that can be provided to shareholders, and this is called a preemptive right. And what this means is that if a shareholder is given this right, it, it enables them to participate in any further issue issuances of shares in their class before they're issued in any sort of another way, public market, what have you. So this protects the shareholder from involuntary dilution of the shareholder interest. They can decide to purchase more shares or not. But because it's pretty inconvenient for companies to have to go and consult with the existing shareholders anytime that they want to issue more shares, this has been eliminated, this right has been eliminated by many corporations. Another reason that so many companies in Canada are organized as corporations is because the shares can be easily transferred. So they're highly marketable and attractive to investors. The corporation is required to keep a record of all shareholders at all times for the purposes of voting. And uh, normally because the shares are traded so often, the company will outsource this to a transfer agent or registrar who, whose job and whose main business is to keep track of the, uh, the names and addresses of the shareholders. Common shares are the basic ownership interest in a corporation. So every corporation has to have a class of common shares. And these shares carry the residual risks and rewards of ownership, meaning that they participate in all the profits, in the profits of the company. And they'll also uh, participate, like if the business is dissolved, they'll be the ones that get paid out last. A common shareholder is not guaranteed a dividend or assets upon dilution. Uh, generally, they can, they do have voting rights, and they will participate in the profit if the company is successful and distributions are declared by the board of directors. And like I said earlier, if there's only one class of shares, it has to, by definition, be a common share. There are also uh, investments that are in substance common shares. So what this means is that within the, the spectrum of shares, there's a variety of different uh, trade-offs that can be made by shareholders in terms of which class of shares that they might wanna participate in. And even though there will be a, a class of, of true common shares, there could be another class that's in substance common shares, meaning that the, the shares are very, uh, very similar to common shares, but there's something that's a little bit different about it. Basically, they're the same as common shares. So an investment with risks and reward characteristics that are substantially similar to common shares can be called in substance common shares. And it's important to make this distinction from an accounting perspective because shares and financial instruments can get quite complicated. And we're gonna take a look at that in the next chapter. So sometimes you'll see that shares have different, um, different characteristics that can lead them to be classified as debt in the liability section of the balance sheet, or that could lead them to be classified as a share in the shareholders equity section of the balance sheet. So it's really important to make that distinction about what we're talking about here, if it's, if it's a true equity classification or if it's a debt classification. And deciding whether to treat financial instruments as common shares, it's important to consider subordination. So do they have any preferred rank over other shares? If not, then they, would, they may meet the definition of in substance common shares. Do they have uh, risks and rewards of ownership? So do the shares participate in the earnings or losses of the company? If so, perhaps they're in substance common shares. Do they have any obligation to transfer value? So do they have any sort of um, cumulative dividend rate or anything like that? If not, there no, there's no requirement to transfer value, then maybe they do meet the criteria of in substance common shares. Are there any other common shares? If all shares in the class have to have the same features. So to thinking about you know, how these differ from the true common shares. And also if the shares are redeemable or retractable um, in any sort of situation other than wind up of the company, if the only way that these shares could be retracted is if the company liquidates, then perhaps they're in substance common shares. Another type of share, in order to attract different investors, corporations may offer two or more classes of shares with each class having different rights and privileges 
a special class of shares, and because they have certain preferential rights, these shares can be called preferred shares. And a certain, they have different characteristics depending on what the shareholder agreement states, but some of the common, uh, some of the common uh, attributes associated with common shares is they may have a, they have a priority claim on earnings and assets upon dissolution. So what that means is that preferred shareholders will always be paid out before common shareholders. So they receive any sort of um, dividend first, and they'll also receive any sort of set uh, if the if the company's wound up, they'll receive the payout of assets before the common shareholders. Um, and generally these invest in order to receive those rights, these investors sa often sacrifice voting rights and they often sacrifice the right to, to share in profit beyond the stated rate. So if the, if, the div if the preferred shares say that they pay out dividends say at 5% a year, then that's the maximum that they'll receive unless they have an additional right attached to them, even though the common shareholders perhaps are getting paid out at 10%. So preferred shares may also be issued with a dividend preference expressed as a percentage of the issue price. So for instance, they can be called 8% preferred shares or they could have a specific dollar amount per share, say $8 per share. It's important to note that this preference does not assure dividends will be paid. And there's no liability until the dividends are declared by the board of directors. But what it means is that these dividends have to be paid before any dividends can be paid out on the common shares. So they have to, if it's not declared one year, it has to be made up in the other year. The shortfall has to be made up. And some companies specifically structure their equity issuance uh, around managing their debt to equity ratio. So they're thinking about trying to structure these shares in a way that they'll meet the equity criteria for accounting because they're trying to make sure they don't want to lay down their balance sheet or their statement of financial position with additional debt. So some different shares have different characteristics and in whatever combination they can uh, the companies can issue more than one class of preferred shares, but some common preferred share features include the following. So they can be cumulative, meaning that dividends on cumulative shares that are not paid in any given year are known as dividends in arrears. And these dividends must be made up in a later year before any profits can be distributed to common shareholders. But as I said before, there's no liability until the board of directors declares a dividend. And it's also worth noting that if the corporate charter is silent about the cumulative feature, the preferred share is assumed to be cumulative. Convertible, this feature allows the company or holder to exchange the shares for common shares at a predetermined ratio. So the shareholder has the relative security of the preferred share, yet they may gain of the, the appreciation of the company by converting the preferred share to a common share if it's, if it's prefer preferable to them callable or redeemable. The issuing corporation can call or redeem at its option or through the company's choice, the outstanding preferred shares at specified future dates and, and future prices. So if the shares are callable or redeemable, this will often set a cap on the market value of the shares um, unless they can be converted into common shares. Retractable is where the holders of the shares can put or sell their shares back to the company at a, at a predetermined price, meaning that the shareholder can decide whether they want to sell their shares on the open market or whether they want to sell them back to the company. So it's attractive for investors. And last but not least, participating, meaning that preferred shareholders can uh, participate in any profit distributions that are above the stated rates of their shares. So they can... Uh, perhaps match the, the uh, participation rate of the common shareholders. Okay, so we talked about 
why so many companies are organized as corporations. And that's because the fact that the shareholder's liability is limited to the amount that they invested. So even if the company goes bankrupt, there's no way that the uh, creditors of the company could come after any of the shareholders' homes or cars or personal assets. They're, they're, the potential loss in the company is limited to the amount that they invested in the shares. So the shares that they own could become worthless and that's their risk but there's no risk beyond that amount. And this again is very different than a proprietorship or a partnership where creditors can come after shareholders' personal assets. Another interesting thing about corporations is that the corporate charter protects or the, the CBCA, the government gives, protects the share capital amount. So the corporation cannot, um, the corporation cannot withdraw the share capital amount unless all prior claims have been paid. So this means the corporation must maintain the capital until the corporation is dissolved. So whatever you see in the share capital um, accounts of a of a of a corporation, those will be there until that corporation is wound up. They can't dissolve the the capital accounts. They can, however, ret uh, return the shares if they're retractable or there's some different things that can happen there, but the company can actually just change, can actually just pull money out of those capital accounts, meaning share capital and contributed surplus. Retained earnings is a different account, which we'll talk about later. So there is this concept of par value and par value is basically in, in Canada under the CBCA, it states that shares must be without nominal or par value. What does that mean? Well, basically it can get a bit complicated in other jurisdictions, but essentially the par value can be some sort of a, a predetermined amount that shareholders are at risk for. In Canada under the CBCA, the maximum amount that a shareholder is at risk is whatever they put into the corporation. And that can be different for me versus you, depending on how much I put in versus how much you put in. So the proceeds from shareholders are credited to the share capital account, and they become part of the investment. And uh, this establishes the maximum responsibility in case of insolvency. All right, so dividends, dividends are an interesting topic. So an enterprise's owners decide what to do with profits that are realized through operations. And profits may be left in the business for future expansion or to have a margin of safety, or they may be withdraw withdrawn and divided among the owners of the corporation. There are a few rules around issuing dividends. And first, dividends cannot be distributed unless the capital of the company is intact. And this means that there has to be sufficient net assets or security left in the corporation to satisfy the liability holders after any assets have been distributed. So the company still has to be in a secure place to be able to pay off any liabilities with its assets. Uh, the dividend can't put that in jeopardy. Second, distributions must be approved by the board of directors and the dividends must comply with any stipulations in the capital contracts. Determining the proper amount of dividends to pay is a difficult financial management decision. Very few companies pay dividends in amounts equal to their legally available retained earnings. And there's several reasons for this. Um, there, there may be agreements with, cover, with uh, creditors to retain assets in the company or to prevent the distribution of dividends. The company may want to retain assets in, terms to in order to finance future growth or expansion. The company may want to smooth out dividend payments from year to year by accumulating earnings in good years and using such accumulated earnings to pay out dividends in bad years. And the company may want to build up a cushion or a buffer against possible losses or errors in the calculation of profits. So the, the distribution needs to be justified by, pure, by present and future financials. And it needs to be consider inflation, inflation and replacement costs. So a lot of things need to be considered in terms of deciding, in terms of a company's management deciding what amount of dividend they want to issue. 
And some companies have different, uh, different philosophies here. There's a lot of established companies that are very committed to issuing consistent dividends. And there are other companies that where the dividends really fluctuate based on the performance of the company. All right, we finished learning objective one. So let's move on to learning objective number two. And this is an, our most important learning objective in chapter 15. And this learning objective, we're going to explain how to account for the issuance, reacquisition, and retirement of shares, stock splits, and dividend distribution. So shares are sold for the price in the marketplace. So the price of shares is, is a market determinant. And the net amount received is credited to the common share or the preferred share account in the capital section or in the equity section. And normally the company will hire specialists to value the shares upon when the company first goes public um, to promote and sell them. And as payment for their services, the underwriters will take a commission as a percentage of the total share consideration that is received. And we record the amount that we received in that capital section as net of this commission payment or any sort of a direct transaction cost. So here's an example. So Gold Corporation issued 4,000 of its common shares for $66,000. The company also incurred $1,700 of costs associated with issuing the shares. Prepare the journal entry to record the share issuance. Well, we're going to get cash in, but how much cash should we actually receive? Well, we received 66,000 over here, but then we had to pay out 1,700. So the net amount that we received was 64,300. And that's what we're going to debit to cash. And then we're going to credit common shares in our shareholders equity section for the same amount, 64,300. So you can see that the, the commission that we paid on issuing these shares has actually resulted in us having a lower common share value than we would have if we had recorded the entire 66,000. And if this question said that they had issued preferred shares, it would be the exact same journal entry. We would simply have a credit to preferred shares rather than common shares. All right, so something that can happen when companies issue shares is that they may not require the purchaser to pay for the shares right away. Sometimes this can happen when the company lends, lends employees money to buy shares, or they can shares can also be sold in the market on a subscription basis, which means that the full share price is not received immediately, sometimes a partial payment's received, and then the share is not issued until the full subscription price is received. So how do we account for this, thinking about it? So we're not gonna receive cash like we did in our previous entry. Now we're gonna have some sort of a receivable. So what should our credit be to common shares? Would it still be the entire amount? Well, this is something that's uh, different here because if you think about it, that receivable does seem to meet the definition of an asset as it does represent future benefit to the company in the form of incoming cash. So normally we would just have debit cash, debit receivable, credit common shares. However, IFRS states that treating the asset, treating the receivable as an asset results in share capital also increasing. Because if you think about that example, our common shares would still be the entire co combination of the cash and the receivable. And this is not considered transparent in reporting. So we actually only record the net amount. So let's take a look at what that looks like. And both IFRS and ASPE are aligned here. So ASPE actually provides the most guidance, which is pretty unique because normally IFRS is providing all the guidance and ASPE is just more vague. But in this situation, ASPE is the, the guidance that's very specific saying, listen, any sort of a receivable for common shares cannot be uh, fully recorded in the common shares because those shares aren't actually issued. So it needs to be recorded on a net basis. And IFRS, although it's less specific, it does support this approach through the conceptual framework. So here's an example of what we're talking about. So individuals are given the right to purchase 10 common shares at $20 per share, 50 people accept and they pay 50% down and they'll pay the balance in six months. So how much are these shares worth? Well, we've got 10 common shares at $20 per share. 
and 50 people accept. So we've got 10. You can see for the subscriptions receivable there, we've got 10, 10 uh, common shares times $20 per share would be 200 per person. And then we've got 50 people that did that. So that's $10,000. And so what we've, the first entry here is debit to the subscriptions receivable and credit to common shares subscribed. And so this is a specific line in our equity section that's different than common shares. It just means that people have subscribed to these common shares, but we don't have the cash yet. And then we are going to record the actual amount that we received. So 20, 10 common shares times $20 per share, 50 people accepted, but they only paid 50% down. So half of 10,000 for the 50% down is going to give us 5,000. And we're going to record debit cash and credit subscriptions receivable. Meaning that we've got cash in and we've reduced the, the receivable on the subscriptions, but we haven't actually issued any shares yet because all that's happened is 50 people have paid us half but no one's paid us 100%. So you can see all the credits here are going to our common share subscribed account. So six months later, when we receive the other 50% from um, the 50% that had been down paid, so they still owe us 50%, then we're gonna record the other $5,000 of our cash. So we're gonna say debit cash, credit share subscriptions receivable. And then we're gonna record the issuance of those shares because now that they've paid us the complete cash, we can change that uh, account from common shares subscribed to common shares, common share capital. So it's gonna be credit common shares subscribed to reduce that amount, take that amount off of our statement of financial position and credit common shares, putting this into our equity section. And you can see then that we've, the receivable has been completely paid. There's no more common shares subscribed. And now we've got common share capital at 10,000. So that's, that um, example was interesting because all of the 50% of the people that had given us half of the payment gave us the rest. What would happen if some of the people that owed us the remainder of the payment didn't pay? So what happens if the subscription receivable becomes a default. It goes into collections or like it's not being paid. What do we do then? So there's a few options. We could return the amount paid to the subscriber. We could treat the amount paid as forfeited and therefore we would move it to the contributed surplus account because no shares are ever gonna be issued. Or we could issue fewer shares to the subscriber to, if, to uh, balance out what they had actually paid us for. And the actual contract with the shareholders is where what's going to specify how a defaulted subscription receivable will be treated. So in this example, thinking back to the example we just looked at, assume that the subscribers to 50 of the $20 shares defaulted. And we are also going to assume that the share contract states that the amounts will be refunded. So we've got 50 times 20. So we've got $1,000 of, share, of shares that are, being, uh, that are going into default and we need to refund the $1,000. So we're going to reduce common shares subscribed by 1,000 because we're never gonna issue those shares. So we're gonna take it out of common shares subscribed. We're gonna reduce the subscription receivable by 500 and we're gonna have a payable of 500 because we only had half of the amount in subscriptions receivable and we're gonna to have to pay out the remainder through accounts payable. And if we were not gonna refund it, then the, uh, the, the $500 would be a credit to contributed surplus rather than to accounts payable. But in this scenario, because we're refunding it, there's no entry to contributed surplus here. All right, so another thing that can happen is that corporations normally issue each class of shares separately, but it can happen that one type or class can be issued at the same time. So for instance, if you acquire a company, you might acquire all the shares of the company for one purchase price. So the question is then, how do you allocate the purchase price between the different capital accounts? 
And so thinking about that, we need to think about our lump sum uh, allocation methodology that we've seen in other sections of this course. And this is where we need to allocate the proceeds among the separate classes of shares using the relative fair value. So we're either gonna allocate the fair values proportionately or we're gonna value one instrument. If we know one, then we can allocate the rest. So normally in these questions, we're often using the relative fair, the relative fair value. Um, and we've looked at this in some of our other chapters, bundled revenue, allocation of basket purchases for PP&E, et cetera. So we'll take a look at some questions in the tutorial section. The cost of issuing shares, so direct incremental costs incurred to sell the shares are deducted from the proceeds, which we talked about earlier. So again, these can include underwriting costs, accounting and legal fees, printing costs, taxes, and issuing costs are charged to the related share account because they are capital. They're not an operating transaction, but management salaries or any sort of cost for maintaining records are normally charged to operating expenses because they're difficult to establish a relationship between the expense and share capital. It's not unusual for companies to buy back their shares. A reason that a company might wanna do this is to increase the earnings per share because they have less shares outstanding or increase their return on equity. They might wanna have them on hand for a business acquisition, or they might provide shares for employee share compensation contracts, et cetera. Um, there can also be leveraged buyouts, which is where management or employee group purchases shares to use them as collateral. Once shares are reacquired, they can either be retired or they can be held as treasury shares, which means they're kind of being held by the company for reissue. So they're not active because they're not trading in the market, they're being held by the company. So they're kind of in limbo and these are called treasury shares. In Canada, the CBCA requires repurchase shares be canceled and restored to status of authorized but unissued if a limit to the number of authorized shares exists. So there are some rules around what companies can hold back from the market. When shares are purchased or redeemed, it's likely that the purchase price will differ from the amount received. And if there's a difference between the assigned value and the lower cost of acquisition, so if we repurchase the shares at a favorable amount, then we are going to be hitting this contributed surplus account, which is kind of like a bonus equity account. So if the acquisition cost is more than the original price received, then we have to allocate it through share capital, then to contributed surplus and lastly to retained earnings. And if the acquisition cost is less than what we received, then it's gonna to go to share capital and then contributed surplus. And again, ASPE provides the most guidance here, but IFRS is consistent. So here's an example. So Cook Corporation has the following in its shareholders equity account. So you can see we've got class A shares, class B shares, retained earnings. So the average class A per share is going to be, oops, is gonna be, oh, sorry, one second. So the average per share is gonna be 63,000 here, divided by the amount outstanding, 10,500 is gonna give us an average of $6 per class A share. On January 30th, Cook purchased and canceled 500 class A shares at a cost of $4 per share. So <clears throat> we know that we've got 500 shares. So we need to remove the average cost of the shares from our, our equity account. So we're gonna take 500 shares times the $6 per share that we calculated right here. We calculated 63,000 divided by the amount outstanding, 10,500 gave us that $6. So 500 times $6 is gonna give us 3,000. And we're gonna debit that amount from our class A shares uh, equity section so that we are removing the share capital associated with those shares. You can see we're using the average cost method here. And then we're going to debit cash because we're gonna pay out $4. So this is gonna be 500 times $4, uh, 2,000, say 500 times $4, 2,000. And the difference 
between the 3,000 that we took out of the common share account and the 2,000 that we paid for the shares is going to go to contributed surplus because this is a bonus to the company because we bought the shares back for less than we received for them. So we essentially received a benefit of $1,000 because those shares are not outstanding. And now we've managed to pocket the, the $1,000. All right, on September 10th, 2020, the company purchased and canceled an additional 1,000 Class A shares. The purchase cost was $8 per share. So in this circumstance, you can see, we know that our average cost for those shares was $6. And now we're purchasing them back at $8. So this is actually bad for the company. Before we're purchasing them back at $4, that's good. We paid six, we're buying them back for four. But now we paid, we got six and now we're buying them back for eight. So how would it look if it was going the other way? So again, we're going to debit the common share account for 6,000 to remove the share capital associated with those 500 shares, or sorry, the 1,000 shares <clears throat> at $6. Then we are going to have cash out, um, outstanding, which was 1,000 shares times $8. So we paid out 8,000. So we know the 6,000 and we know the 8,000. So the difference between these two is $2,000. So where does the $2,000 go to balance that entry? Well, we already had $1,000 sitting in contributed surplus from our previous uh, purchase at $6. So we're gonna clear that out, the contributed surplus, because essentially now we're behind the ball. We are actually losing money on those shares. So we're gonna take out any sort of a bonus that we received on the shares before. We're gonna debit the contributed surplus account to remove that. We still have $1,000 over that amount that we paid. So not that additional amount is gonna go through our retained earnings. And that concludes chapter 15, lecture part one. Please join me for the tutorial section where we'll go through a variety of questions regarding the concepts we just discussed.